In the episode 606 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome, everyone, to FDH Lounge mini-episode number 606. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris. We are happy to welcome back to the program one of our favorite ongoing guests. This is a show that, again, we like to style ourselves as being at the intersection of smart and funny. I don't know how often we visit that, but figuratively, whenever we do visit that place, we always encounter this gentleman. Uh, He is a fine example of the intersection of smart and funny. Again, originally making his bones as a fitness expert, fitnessmadesimple.com. Again, I have the book, and uh, it is a tremendous work he has branched out from there with new media stew and culture pop branding himself these days as a commentator and expert on all things new media pop culture and uh, all the different things that are going on with uh, celebrities and offering his takes on events such as the 2015 emmys which we are going to be breaking down today of course at john day style on twitter you can find from there as he notes that uh, he has his works up on Vine, YouTube, AOL, MSN, Daily Motion, and Hollywood Life. I think since the last time we had him on, I think he has been putting uh, an increased emphasis on Vine. I think that has been something that's been more recent, but uh, we'll talk to him about that, get his thoughts on the 2015 Emmys. Were they related pop culture-wise to last year, where I sort of had the sense that they made a little bit more of a dent in terms of water cooler talk, but we'll get his thoughts on this. Always happy to welcome back to the show the great John Baystow. John, welcome back to the show, my friend. Great to have you on today. Oh, uh, you know I love being on FDH Lounge, Rick. Rick. And the thing is, um, I love the compliment, by the way. Uh, smart and funny. I will try not to be dumb and boring. <laughs> I, I have very little fear about that. Uh, I don't know if you could do it if you tried, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I want to get oh, there, your there, thoughts there, on there are day, the, Rick, there are days, there are days. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how uh, how smart at least I'm going to come across when I tell you this uh, to lead in. I actually didn't catch any of the Emmys last night, red carpet or otherwise, because going okay. against, I would say, the most attractive Sunday night football game of the season, wasn't going to miss any yes. of that, plus WWE Night of Champions. So I don't know how smart I come across for mentioning those two things myself. But uh, I have boned up here. I've done some research. I've looked at what happened with uh, – the Emmys, and my first thought is that unlike last year when we were talking to you, you had that back-to-back with the MTV Video Music Awards, and it seemed right. to me like there was a little bit of synergy, water cooler talk between the two. Is it just me, or pop culture-wise, was this one pretty flat this year? I don't think it was flat. I mean, um, you know, when, when you when you have two of the award shows so close together, like the um, you know the MTV Awards and that one, I mean, the talk tends to I think gel into both of them. Um, okay. Whereas like when there's a little bit of a break, um, it's not. I, I think this one actually had a lot of talk in the sense of there was a lot of firsts um, with this particular Emmy Awards, which was amazing. I mean, obviously um, Viola Davis being the first Afro American woman woman to uh, win Best uh, Lead Actress yes. was amazing. Uh, I thought it was extremely funny that um, uh, Uzu Adubu uh, from Orange is the New Black uh, was the first actor, male or female, to win both the Comedy Award and the Drama Award for the same character since Ed Asner. That was, um, you know, fun fact, I mean, going way back in the day, but um, that lady is making a mark, which is really, really impressive. And then Orange is the New Black is doing awesome. I mean, not obviously as awesome as... um, Game of Thrones, and uh, Olive Kittredge, which I have to admit I've never seen, but they walked away with a lot of Emmys. Um, And I've never seen a more depressed uh, winner than Frances McDormand. Um, I mean, she looked like somebody just killed her lizard when she walked up and accepted that award. I never saw a, a, a a less excited person to win an award in my life. 
Very strange. Yeah, you don't get that very often. And uh, to go further on one of those firsts, as far as uh, best Hamm. comedic, my other one. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. For 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 best comedic and best dramatic, that's even more impressive occurring on the same show because with Ed Asner wasn't one of those for Mary Tyler Moore, which was more of a comedic bent, and one of those was for Lou Grant, which had uh, more of a dramatic bent. We're, we're talking about the same show, so that's that's incredible range right there. A hundred percent. You are a hundred percent correct. And I mean, grant that he was playing the same name character, but I mean, the Lou Grant on the drama, I mean, if you go back into archives and stuff like that, and I've even um, you know, seen that the, uh, what is it, the NBC, um, you know, radio and TV museum um, here in New York, uh, I mean, the, the Lou Grant show is, is nothing like what he was in Mary Tyler Moore, where he's like, right. you, you know, the, the comedy, I mean, it, it, it's, it's almost not the same character, but carrying over the same name, I think, to have, you know, that identification with the viewers. But, um, you know, Uzu was, uh, it just, it also shows, I think, the fluidity of shows nowadays, because when can you ever imagine a show that can actively compete and, and really seriously compete in both a comedy and a drama category? So much so that one year it can win a lot of comedy awards and one year it can win a lot of drama awards. I mean, that's where we're getting, I think, nowadays a fluidity in shows where drama sort of flows into comedy. You can have both elements. Um, and that's, I think, where Orange is the New Black stands out. And I, but I think also a lot of other shows have both those elements, just not, you know, to the uh, degree that Orange is the New Black has. Exactly, yeah. It's very, very hard to uh, stand squarely uh, in both of those realms, and they seem to manage to, p- to pull it off. Uh, there were, of course, uh, some things, of course, that were happening with, with this, some, of, some of the winners last night, some of the uh, the drama that was involved in that, and when I uh, describe everything as sort of flat from a pop culture sense, I certainly don't want to disrespect any of the winners, but the overall event, looking at it the day after, I, I got a sense as I was going back and doing my research, I was mm-hmm. expecting it would be a little bit easier to kind of find general impressions out there that people had, and I uh, really seemed to be kind of uh, digging around and not a lot of subjects that were uh, gaining attention. I know one of the ones that always does to whatever degree is the red carpet. And of course, Mm -hmm. outside of Heidi Klum doing the big bird thing there with her outfit, uh, there wasn't Mm -hmm. a whole lot going on. It seemed like, you know, I was reading some stuff that indicated, well, with the heat, whatever. And I'm thinking, geez, is that really going to stop anybody on such a big night? I was going to go out there and try to steal the show, but Mm -hmm. it's too hot and I don't want to sweat. So what do you attribute that to? Is it just sort of this, this moment in fashion where there wasn't as much popping or, you know, why, why do you think the red carpet wasn't as much of a blow away as it is some years? I definitely will agree with you um, that as far as red carpets go, this one was definitely flatter than others. You're always going to have the Emmys be a little bit flatter than the MTV Awards. You're never going to have the mm-hmm. world cooler talk about red carpet like you are going to have after the um, MTV uh, VMAs, the movie awards, and, and, and even the Grammys to, to some extent because there's just so much more – flair and there's so much more personality but you do have a little bit more risks being taken in the emmys than i think were done this year i don't know if it's the heat or anything i I mean i think every i think there were no super standouts in the sense i don't think anybody was so amazing and jaw-dropping that you're out of the ordinary of what they normally are i mean obviously you know i mean sofia vergara always looks stunning in what she wears but you begin to expect it so the bar is high to begin with. But I don't think anybody, you know, far exceeded the bar so much that people were talking about it at the water cooler afterwards today. And nobody went so much out on a risk that it was, um, you, you know, to the point that it was going to be talked about either. So in that case, it was sort of midland. Um, you know, there weren't any, like, huge, you know, failures, and there weren't any I- I- enormous successes that you just, you know, couldn't stop talking about. It was more so... Um, the awards. I think the set, personally, was one of the best it's ever been. I like that futuristic set. I thought it was really cool, and you know, it looked very, very expensive. I mean, more so than I think some other Emmy sets have done in the past. It certainly did from the pictures that I saw. I would agree with you on that. And uh, to, as a point of uh, uh, segueing here to talking about the actual event from the red carpet, I mean, I don't know if this is one of these causation or correlation deals, but. You know, any of these things, and you referenced, of course, the Oscars and the the MTV Video Music Awards, everybody's got their red carpet. It's all become like the Super Bowl Mm -hmm. pregame show that stretches on, you know, what are you wearing, Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. With with a red carpet that we both agree 
pop culture wise was a little bit flatter than in years past. Could that in any mm-hmm. way have contributed to the lowest ratings ever for the show? Is, is there any Definitely. sense that a lot of times of people getting buzz during the pre-show and sticking around for the show, you think it hurt? Um, with, with me, I think it definitely does because I, I usually, because um, I, I do your show and, and some other shows and stuff like that, the same talk. I definitely try to get, um, you know, watch the e-red carpet or whatever show is doing a, a red carpet thing, and that definitely gets me more enthused uh, mm-hmm. for the, um, you know, for, for seeing the actual event. And I think that if it's not your job, which, of course, for me it is part of, um, I think if the red carpet isn't super interesting or super entertaining, I think you're going to have a drop off for viewers. But you also pointed out something else. You're up against the big game. It's, it, 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 it's, you, when you have other competition um, you know, going on, there's going to be less water cooler talk uh, as opposed to if it was just the Emmys and nothing else, even though it's hitting a different audience. That's very interesting because in, in a way you could have seen this coming – months and months and months ago at the release of the NFL schedule, because Mm -hmm. uh, I'll I'll tell you, in in our football guide for this year, we had this rated as not just the number one Sunday night game of the season, but the number one overall game, Green Bay and Seattle last night. So one wonders as far back as then if the entertainment industry honchos might have been going, "Uh uh-oh, this is going to be a tough one. Yeah, and also remember, I mean, also think about the economy. A lot of families nowadays – um, you know, are a one TV household with cable simply because it's too expensive to have more than one. And if mm-hmm. you have a family and dad is watching the football, you know, all of a sudden the Emmys may not be on in that house, period. Um, you know, and, and uh, so that's, just, that's just another realistic thing. You don't have a lot of, and I know a lot of my friends in particular have gone down to like, you know, one TV or wait or getting rid of the TV completely and watching on the internet afterwards. Um, so it's very, very hard. I, th- I think you're putting one extra obstacle in front of yourself if you aren't, if you don't have the foresight to look at when you're scheduling a big event like that to see if there's not a potential other event that's going to outcompete you. I think that's a big problem right there. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, bad luck on that. Uh, so, such a monster game, a rematch of the NFC Championship game happening last night opposite it, and uh, who knows uh, to what extent that that might have uh, played a part as well, but uh, it's interesting also, too, because when I was trying to think about possible causes for that, in a way, the the long-awaited breakthrough here, sort of the Susan Lucci moment last night for for, uh, John Hamm, uh, who, by the way, created what what, a great pop culture moment. Yeah. (laughs) Well, not using the stairs. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was he was so excited when he finally hit it that, uh, you know, he didn't even use the stairs for that. So I guess that was one of the pop culture moments out of the night, huh? Definitely, definitely. Um, that, and especially being at the, you know, after, I mean, his last chance to win for Mad Men um, is, uh, I mean, that, that, that was awesome. And, and I'm very glad that he got it for that. Um, I, I actually, to be honest with you, didn't even, I, I know he had, he had lost a number of Emmys and been nominated, but I didn't realize it was 16 at the time. Right. Um, I mean, how many did Susan Wichita go? Was it, was, it, was it 16, 18, or 20? Because I know she ended up winning like one or two eventually. But, um, but I remember the, the, the first streak had to be a, a, a 16 or an 18 also, yep. just like that. It was, it was, it was right enormous. In there. It was. It was. You know, and that's, that's my sense too. I mean, again, I don't know if I'm making, you know, a, a, um, a mountain out of a molehill here, but when I look at that with John Ham, it seemed to be sort of symbolic to me. And again, I'm a big Mad Men guy, a big John Ham guy. I thought there were a number of times he deserved to win and didn't. Although all the times he was mm-hmm. going up against Brian Cranston, it was pretty hard to say who was more yeah. deserving. But you know, Breaking Bad is gone. Mad Men is now gone. And, and I'm looking at this and I'm going, are we at a moment here where? You know, the the shows that began to define this new golden age of TV, most of them are now gone. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, you know, are we sort of at the end of one moment TV-wise, at least quality and critical TV-wise, and not quite at the beginning of a new moment? I don't know. I mean, did John Hamm winning last night sort of seem symbolic of that to me? And yeah, I wonder if that played its way out in, in the ratings yet, that, you know, we haven't had things that have quite replaced the grip of Mad Men and Breaking Bad in, in, in the popular mind? Or am I making too much of that point, maybe? I, I mean, I, I think it's more of the competition of what was on um, on the mm-hmm. TV and the fact that there were, there were no super standout things. I don't think this Emmys was, I mean, certainly lackluster compared to a lot of other ones. It just was um, maybe a little less so than last year. 
Um, but then also with the other competition, like we were talking about in the same time slot, it was bad. Um, but, I mean, I think in any age of TV, there's always going to be standouts. Because, I mean, yeah, you're talking about Mad Men and you're talking about, um, you know, uh, Breaking Bad being gone. But look at Empire to filling in that void. I mean, that's a hugely, hugely talked about show. I love that show. And um, I, I, I actually like it better than both of the other shows, but that's just me. Um, but the thing is, there's always going to be something that fills the void. And, and, and I don't think it's any less of a golden age uh, without those shows. Um, and look at Orange is the New Black taking over. The only thing is, I think now, it, uh, this was one of the first Emmys where I saw winners uh, that were shows that I had never like heard of, like Olive Kittredge and stuff like that, that were significant winners. And it's also mm-hmm. one of the first Emmys where a show that I love, um, like Inside Amy Schumer, actually won something. That is, I think, like a little show that could. Granted, she is the it girl at the moment, and I think she's awesome. Um, and I think that movie, um, which is, I think, a much lower budget movie, a train wreck than a lot of other movies, and so outperformed the bigger budget movies, just blew them away. And was and I thought uh, solidified her as a star, and she's going to have a big career now. Uh I don't see. I, I don't remember many Emmys where a show that is not on that often, like an Inside Amy Schumer, not super buzzed about show until you know she started uh, picking up in other areas too, would walk a ho- would walk home with an Emmy like that, and that I thought was impressive. Um, she also had yep. a lot of nominations that she didn't win, but to walk away with Best Variety Sketch Series was was, was uh, I think a very big coup for a very small show. It definitely was a coup for them. Uh, you know, me personally, uh, if uh, Comedy Central sketch shows were going to be getting some love, I, I'm a homer. I would have liked to have seen some thrown Nick Kroll's way for Kroll's show, but that's just mm-hmm. me. But, uh, you know, that is but a very that, uh, funny show as well. That, and that's, but that's what I'm talking about. Do you ever even see those shows being nominated or even looked at? I don't even see right. them in the nominations usually. So the fact right. that you did see a show like an Inside Amy Schumer in, the nom- in multiple nominations and then winning a big award and her getting up on stage and also presenting and everything, I think that's more of a turn that we're seeing that a lot of the smaller cable channels that are like the little engines that could are playing ball with the big engines. And, that's, and, and, and that I think is, and that I thought was very interesting. And, and, and a lot of shows that necessarily may not have the water cooler talk behind them, may not have the um, buzz behind them, like an Olive Kittredge, is able to walk away with a lot of awards. Well, I have to say, too, uh, you're, you're giving me something to think about. You mentioned uh, a moment ago about uh, Empire and how much you like it. Uh, I have not gotten well, to check it out yet, but uh, if, you're, if you're putting it over that strongly, you may, you may uh, force me to uh, take a look at it here and see what it's all about. Well, I, 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 I adore uh, Taraji Henson. I think she is awesome. I fell in love with her when she played Brad Pitt's mom in Benjamin Button. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, of course, Cookie is a totally – and I had not seen her in anything before that – um, and Cookie is a totally different character, but Cookie is badass AF, and she is a joy to watch. One of the probably one of the best characters on TV, if not the best character on TV right now. But that being said, so Empire is one of my must sees. The other one coming out this week, one of my must sees is Nashville, which uh, doesn't get a lot of awards love, but um, I think that's an amazing, amazing show. I know a lot of people are really behind that show and are really entertained by it, and. You, you talk about this moment in TV and uh, the, the, the trend towards some of the niche things here. Certainly, uh, streaming has been really making a dent in the last year <laughs> or two. And, of course, the uh, Transparent, uh, with, with their awards last night, just kind of shows you that uh, if there was any doubt whatsoever, they, they had climbed up on a par with cable. Uh, I, I think it, that's all gone. If you're on especially Netflix Amen. or Amazon, I think you've got as good a chance to win as anybody. Which is which is another thing that uh, when I'm say, when I, there's, the, the times they are a change in as they always are because everything's very fluid when it comes to that. That's a huge thing for a Netflix show. And look at um, what about uh, and, and, and also Veep, another show you can binge watch um, and mm-hmm. stuff like that, winning winning all those awards. That that is that is a new just like when reality TV back in the day started taking over from scripted television. And people were thinking it was going to be a flash in the pan or how can it compete with all these big budget shows. And then it started taking over, even though it still doesn't win tons of awards. Um, it's, it, as far as viewership, it's taken over in a lot of ways. And as far as production, it's taken over in a lot of ways. Um, this, the new technology of not having to be on a major network, of being able to do an Amazon show, of being able to do a Netflix show, 
of these uh, uh, once were considered obscure outlets um, now becoming mainstream is a huge, huge shift. Absolutely. And uh, in terms of uh, more uh, dominant uh, established uh, ventures out there uh, doing well in this climate. As you mentioned uh, a couple times in passing here with Veep, Game of Thrones, it was a big night again for HBO. And uh, with uh, Breaking Bad being gone, Mad Men with, with, with AMC now not really having a critical counterpart for those, and, and with uh, FX and then some of the other ones really not, at the moment anyway, stepping up. Everything is kind of cyclical, but this does feel like it's HBO's moment in a lot of ways, does it not? Where Until the other networks regroup and get some more critical fare out there, where they're just able to feast on a night like this. Yeah, and H- HBO has been around with quality, um, you know, programming for for such a while now. And that was another change, you know, back uh, several years ago where, you know, everybody, when HBO first came on the scene, and, they, and since they have come on the scene, they have not left with uh, shows that have made the mark. Um, and, and, and the fact is, the fact that you can, you know, um, I mean, I think also what, what helps those shows a lot that a lot of people don't talk about um, aside from the fact that you can binge watch them because they have like uh, little, they, 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 if you missed the first episode of True Blood, okay, on HBO and stuff like that, and it was on Sunday night, you could catch it on whenever it was on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They'd, they'd have multiple episodes. Then you can also watch them on demand and watch them at your leisure because they move on to the on-demand thing, so you can binge watch, binge watch them there. That's something. I mean, you do have it on the major networks because you can technically go to your computer and watch them, but a lot of people don't make that connection like they do with cable. I mean, automatically when you have a cable box and you have Showtime, you have HBO, or then you get Netflix or you have Amazon or whatever, you're already in that binge-watching mentality because you know it goes on demand afterwards so you can watch it whenever you want to. Whereas like a Nashville – I mean, I don't have a DVR anymore because um, I'm also one of those ones that downsize with cable – but I know I put the Nashville or Supernatural or um, some of the MTV shows and stuff like that. Um, I just I, I said, well, let me check the computer to see if they're on. And they do have full episodes on the computer, so you can technically binge watch them. But I don't think the mainstream has made that connection as much as it has with the HBOs, the Netflix, the Amazons, um, which is why uh, you know it fits into people's schedules so much better. I mean, you don't have to be there. You don't have to be present at the time it's broadcast for the first time. You can watch it at your leisure, and they're doing super high-quality, super high-budget programming, so it can keep you occupied for 10, 13 hours if you do want to binge watch. Well, it's funny you mention that about DVR, uh, John. It's just very coincidental in terms of timing because mm-hmm. I've gone the other way on this. So I had to upgrade my Internet at home because the infrastructure uh, for my ISP was just deteriorating. So I ended up getting an upgraded cable thing as part of the uh, mm-hmm. package. I now have it for the first time in my life, and I was talking to a friend of mine and saying, you know, outside of sports, when am I ever going to use it? I use the apps to watch (laughs) a lot of stuff here, you know, on demand. What do you need it for, John? Yeah. Well, well, it's funny because um, you know how we're creatures of habit. And uh, and, uh, and, and I'm I'm definitely a thrifty – I'm I'm a thrifty son of a gun, so it is what it is. Um, But the thing is Uh I'm used to – I've had the DVR since I had gotten cable. And I was on the phone with the cable company, and uh, you know, uh, one of the other cable companies was actually trying to take me away from the cable company that I'm on now. And they were like, oh, we can get it to half the size of that bill, and if you just get rid of the DVR, it would be even below half the size. And I'm like, well, the DVR is important. I take it. He goes, well, just try, a, try like a week without it. You'll realize you don't really care about it that much. He goes, most people, they get rid of the DVR. And you save like $15, $20 because you save like um, $15 when you get rid of the DVR, and then you save $5 for the extra box. Um, yep. So you end up getting like a twenty dollar discount, but anyway, um, so he goes just and it was because of him. He goes just try it without a week. He goes he goes while you think you need it, it's just most people when they move to our and I didn't end up even going with that new cable company. But he goes most people when they switch realize they don't even care about it that much. It's just they got gotten used to it. And he was a hundred percent correct because sometimes the DVR would give me pressure because I'm like oh I got to watch these things before it fills the, you know uh, before I delete them or whatever. Uh, whereas now right. I'm like I'm like uh, whatever I save the money, and um, I if I miss the show I miss the show. But any of the shows on the network I know I can watch on the computer for free, and yep. um, any of the shows on the premium channels like Showtime and HBO I know I can binge watch on demand, and you know there's there's basically a plethora of opportunities now that you don't have to be nailed into any one thing. 
Um, and that's what I think has diluted and fragmented the um, entertainment space in such a way that there's so many more options. And I think it's very hard today for a show to do what I call cut through the clutter. You can have a great, great show, and there are many, many, many great, great shows that have gone the way of the dinosaur and just, you know, been canceled within an episode or two because the network couldn't continue funding it because it just did not get the initial response that it needed to continue. And that happens more and more because um, there's just such a fragmentation and dilution of the marketplace and viewers have so much, so many options that if you don't have your promo game in place, if you don't have, um, you know, such, uh, I, I guess, a, a head of steam or a fire created before your first show even airs, I think you're dead in the water personally. Because even shows on Bravo uh, TV like um, Southern Charm and stuff like that, before it comes out, I'm seeing ads on buses, I'm seeing ads on subways, and this is what would, I mean, in the digital space, be considered probably a smaller show. It's not one of even the major shows on Bravo, but it already has all this promotion behind it to, to get it seen. And I think if you don't have that, you're just completely dead. Absolutely. And uh, in, in terms of the ability of people to catch these shows uh, whenever they want to as well. That has to be factored in. Again, we are in an on-demand age. And like I said, with the channel apps, I'm sitting here going, I'll never need the DVR because, you know, no. FX now, I can watch the league the next day. I can watch review mm -hmm. the next day on Comedy Central, you know, on and on it goes, you know. So it's it's an interesting kind of a, a landscape. But as far as it goes, again, with the Emmys, you know, it, I guess this was my token old man get off my lawn moment here, but I was kind of struck by the, the nature of some of the things we were talking about in terms of pop culture coming out of this one versus the MTV Video Music Awards, which a lot of times it's, okay, well, what, what's the latest look at me stunt with Miley Cyrus from the MTV <laughs> Awards or something like that versus... She, she, she has painted team. herself into a corner. She, 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 she's up the bar so much, it's so hard for her to do something over the top now because no matter what she does, everyone's like, oh, it's Miley. Oh, it's Miley. Yeah, I swear, but I swear she, 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 could cut off herself, she could cut off her head, bounce it like a basketball, and, you, you know, you know, and, and, and do a dance on her hands, and they go, oh, that's Miley. I mean, it's, it's, so, it, it's so hard to top what she's already done, and, and it's the same headlines all the time. But, I, um, you know, that, that's why I think sometimes you need a little bit of space. That's why I think what Lady Gaga, with her going into, while her music career, or maybe she wasn't, um, you know, while different things are going on in music and maybe she's not doing the same type of shock and awe stuff that she had done before or it's not getting the same amount of attention that it got before, I think it's very smart for her to tr transition into acting for a little bit because she still has those music chops. But for her to do something fresh and new, like she's doing now with American Horror Story, and then she can always come back and reignite the music flame, as opposed to constantly trying to reinvent yourself in one venue. Well, uh, you know, if Miley Cyrus was going to cut off her head, I'd certainly purchase that on pay-per-view. But, you know, it's, it's not just her. It's Nicki Minaj. It's a lot of the other ones here, too. Uh, trying to uh, get attention to themselves. A lot of the, the, the talk of beefs between starlets uh, at this mm -hmm. one this past year versus I get the sense that with the Emmys, and, and again, I might be generalizing too much as I want to do sometimes, but one of the big moments that jumped out at everybody was the very moving sort of public reappearance of Tracy Morgan, who was, of course, yes. you know, much beloved. And I, I look at that and I look at the gravitas of that and the courage that it took for him to get back out there and, versus the stunts of the MTV Video Music Awards. And, again, I may be generalizing, but, you know, it, I, to me it kind of shows you a little bit of the difference in the audiences that they're going to. And, again, you know, the, the, you know, the, nobody ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American people. I mean, the MTV Awards always do very well in the ratings, and the Emmys this year did not. But uh, beyond that, from a demographic standpoint, I wonder if the Emmys – uh, are, are hurt a little bit by going for that a little bit more mature audience that's not as much into the uh, teenage stunts. Well I, 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 well, I definitely think you, you hit the nail on the head with that. First of all, I mean, the, the, the Tracy Morgan thing and what you're talking about, the Emmys, I mean, that's defined in one word, a five-letter word called class. I mean, that was just, mm -hmm. you know, using, using class to get it. I mean, classy things getting attention. It's not using class. It's classy things getting attention. It was very nice. It was very heartwarming to see Tracy Morgan get up there, it, it, and he, he was also funny, and it was great to see him after that tragic accident. Um, however, you, you, you can't play – I always say you can't play a game 
by what should be. You have to play a game by the rules that are. And okay. what that means is with the empty, the majority of people that are watching a lot of these shows or, or watching TV and watching the digital space are a lot of the millennials and younger generation. They want to hear the beef between Taylor Swift and, you know, the, the latest cat fight she's having. They want to, you know, uh, I mean, hear some of the more salacious stuff. So, yes, when you go after a more mature audience, you are, dip, you are fishing in a smaller pond, I think, only because, I mean, obviously, while there's just as many mature people as there are less mature people in the world, they're not necessarily watching TV and they're not necessarily watching the Internet and they're not necessarily tweeting about it and they're not necessarily Facebooking about it or vining about it or, you know, Instagramming about it. And that's where the buzz comes from. And the buzz exactly. is generally – the buzz is generated more by – um, uh, the younger generation that is using that, um, and that, and so you, I think you o you always have to include them. You always have to have something that's going to titillate them, to get them talking. Otherwise, you are not going to get the mass audience that you're trying to get in entertainment, which is largely on the digital space: Twitter, um, you know, Facebook, uh, Instagram, everything else. Well, and again, uh, maybe uh, as I talk about that and as I uh, put down the uh, MTV uh, audience there, maybe the high horse I'm riding on is named hypocrisy. And as much as I did confess to missing the Emmys last night in part to watch Vince mm -hmm. McMahon's latest pay-per-view, so I'll give a touche on myself for that one there. But uh, yeah, in, in but terms of – but if but if you knew that Miley Cyrus was going to be cutting off her head and dancing on her hands, you would have flipped over during commercial break. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly, especially since uh, – you know, Vince never fails to disappoint with some of the booking, as was the case again last night. I would not be disappointed by the decapitation of Miley Cyrus. I can guarantee you that. So, you know, that's going to be and, a winner. And, 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 I, and I mean that in the funniest digital sense, not in reality. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean well, in, I mean digital decapitation, not in reality. But, um, but I'm, I'm just the saying, she has, that girl has to raise the bar so high because she's already done it so high. And I actually applaud her in a lot of the things that she's done, whether or not I agree with them is beside the point, but they're done for effect and they're done for a reason. And when you're in the entertainment business, you understand that reason. And as much as you may not like what she's doing, she's playing the game by the existing rules and she's getting results. So don't hate the player, hate the game. Um, and, and, she, but, but she I mean, is changing she, it up. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, at, at, at least this year so at, at the awards. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, at least this year at the awards, she wasn't uh, getting humped by some guy that looked like he stepped out of a Foot Locker commercial. So she's doing it differently from year to year. Oh, you mean Beetlejuice? Uh, <laughs> I was referring to Robin Thicke and his absurd no, that, outfit. That, no, that, that's, that's, that, that, he, he was dressed as Beetlejuice. I mean, yes, you should have Oh, was he? Oh, okay. oh, come on. Okay. Like Beetle... Oh, come on. With the, with, 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 the, uh, with that outfit and everything? I, I thought, I thought that's she right. She was, <laughs> she was twerking with Beetlejuice. you got to be kidding. <laughs> Now, initially, that went over my head, but you're exactly right. You are exactly right about that. You know, one other thing here, since we're laughing, I, I, I had to uh, bring it around to this here, certainly uh, at, at some point. One of the big highlights here for anybody following you on social media, I'd I, I like to have you uh, speak about this a little bit, about the origins sure. of the 7-Eleven Chronicles. I always look forward oh to these. Oh, my God. What initially inspired that, and uh, when can we look forward to some more gems? Well, there probably will be a gem coming tonight because I did have an experience there with, I think there's a Lay's, uh, there, there's, a, there's a Southern biscuits and gravy flavored Lay's potato chip now, which has okay. some funny comments about it when I was there. So you may be seeing a tweet, you may be seeing a Facebook post and a tweet about that coming up. Southern biscuits and gravy, there you go. <laughs> and there was another one called Kettle Cooked, Kettle Cooked Greek Town Gyro. You know, I always wanted a kettle cooked, a kettle cooked Greek Town gyro flavored potato chip. That's the one thing I've been missing in my life, and the only thing that could top that is a Southern style biscuits and gravy potato chip. No, but the Seven Eleven Chronicle. Oh, that's so funny you bring that up. But yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, unusual folks that go to uh, my Seven Eleven, which keeps it interesting. It's like I think the Twin Peaks of uh, convenience stores, um, and I and I I, I, adore, I adore them. And I think the one question everybody asks is like, why are you always at Seven Eleven? Because, and I'll answer this, and hopefully a lot of people are listening so they don't keep asking it, but because I like the do-it-yourself coffee fixins table. I love to play around with all the coffee fixins. It's like my little moment of joy in the day, 
And while you're doing at the coffee fixing table, you see a lot going on. <laughs> I don't even remember the specifics. Maybe you do. But the one woman that you referred to as this woman is my spirit animal. <laughs> oh, like, that's outstanding. Oh, there's, Only John can do that. <laughs> Well, there was one woman in particular. There was one woman in particular. I think there was a sale on items where it was it was supposed to be like uh, you know three bags of crackers or something like that for for for, for you know a dollar fifty. Um, she put a quarter on the t- she gave the clerk a quarter and said keep the change and walked out. I said she should be my financial advisor. <laughs> she eventually stopped it, but she she goes here you go keep the change. <laughs> I think she's going to be Donald Trump's director of the Office yeah, of Management I'm, I'm, and Budget. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like, wait, wait, I need you to be my financial advisor. <laughs> oh, that is outstanding. So, there, there, so, there, so this material. One, one time there was, there was like a dude walking in with a, you know, by, walking in in like a big trench coat and galoshes and walking out with like an igloo cooler or something. I'm like, I'm like he's either off to a party or organ harvesting. <laughs> All right, so this is all totally organic then. I, I didn't know how much of this was creative license and how much of this is stenography. Okay. <laughs> you never you never know. There, there, there's, there's always hyperbole involved in everything, um, but, but usually it, it, it always has an ID, which is called inspired by something. Okay. All right. Well, uh, as I was uh, mentioning at the top here, I know that uh, yes. for anybody that's uh, at John Baystow, uh, on Twitter, uh, when they go check that out, of course, you, you've mm-hmm. always got everything embedded there. But uh, in terms of any other specific links, what should we be talking about here? I know if we're going to be kicking it old school, it's fitnessmadesimple.com. Mm-hmm. But where are the other uh, hubs that uh, people can come and uh, check out your goodness? Oh, well, th- for, by the way, thank you very much for the kind words up at the top. I am doing a lot with Vine, actually. been growing a lot on the Vine right. with a, a series called Wake Up Words, which is motivational, inspiring Vines, and then also Culture Pop. All my pop culture stuff is also on Vine. So you have two totally unrelated things with me on Vine. So if you go to vine.co slash John Basedow um, and also uh, Motivation Nation on Vine, you just search Motivation Nation on Vine, um, you'll see that, but um, all together between me and my business partner, we're about five million strong on the Vine with followers. So it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and that's and that, that that's that's a beautiful platform. I, I came very late to the Vine game, only been doing it about six months, but um, mm-hmm. it's been a beautiful thing, and I definitely look forward to doing a lot more. I love the shareability of them. I love having to edit myself down to six seconds because I think in today's um, low attention span uh, era. Um, I think the shorter the better, and you also get more more you get impactful, shareable nuggets on Vine, and that's what I like about it. Absolutely, and uh, actually, that, that's an inspiration hearing about how well you're doing on that because uh, uh, one of my associates, my good friend Ben Chu from that NBA Lottery Pick dot com, the basketball website, uh, he's moving a lot more into Vine and looking to get as serious on it as you are. So uh, the path that you are blazing. Uh, is an inspiration to others who are looking to uh, take that on as well. So good to see and know that it can be done and that uh, everything with that is going well with you. And, again, uh, all things under the various John Day style brands are uh, things that we love here at the show that I love personally. And, uh, again, it's always a pleasure to get to have you on, John, and pick your brain on some of these things that are happening. I look forward to the next time we're going to be doing this. And in the interim, all the best to you, sir. You are an absolute joy. I love the FDH Lounge, and um, keep going, keep keep making it happen, keep doing what you're doing because I love it. Awesome, I really appreciate it, my friend. Thank you so much for being on today. Uh, this was a great conversation with you, as always. I knew it would be, and thank you all, everybody in the audience, for checking out FDH Lounge mini episode number six oh six. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, 
2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse, and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.